Let's turn to Psalm chapter 25 this evening. Glad someone here is practicing the Joseph principle. In uh, Egypt there, he interpreted Pharaoh's dream with the, the fat cows and the skinny cows. Seven years of plenty followed by the seven years of famine. And uh, Pharaoh said, well, during the, Joseph's plan was during the seven years store up. In the seven years of famine, everybody will come to you to get the food. So uh, I was talking with Mr. Mitchell there the other day, and we had time and determined quite a few people in the candy cell uh, with the candy room decided to practice the Joseph principle in the first week of the candy cell with the seven fat years, and so you, you stored it up. Um, and now we're in the seven lean years, and we're all coming to you begging to buy just a little bit of what you have, so... That's neat and stuff that you want to be biblical, but uh, this isn't uh, Egypt, and you're not Joseph. So so in the meeting tonight, you know, share. All right? We we, we can use that. So God's blessing the candy cell, though, and that's a blessing to to, uh, see how he just continues to bless it. Always always is amazing. So praise the Lord for that. Uh, Psalm chapter 25, we'll read the first five verses. Where the Bible says, Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not mine enemies triumph over me. Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Let them be ashamed which transgress without cause. Show me thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. Lead me in thy truth and teach me. For thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. I guess of anybody in the Bible, if we wanted to try to blame some biblical character for being weak or uh, effeminate, uh, David would not be the one we'd come to. Uh, when we think about what he did as a youth, let alone what he did as a, as a general and a man of war, both while he was on the run uh, from King Saul and after he became king, when we think about all those things he did from his youth up, weakness would not be the, uh, the, 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 the term that, that I would use to describe David, I would use something, a lot of things, but not that. Um, We have uh, God's word that he preserved for us, and and part of it is the prayers of King David, quite a few of them, uh, that are in the Psalms. And uh, a lot of these Psalms we can trace back to actual events in the life of King David and see what was going on in his life that caused him to write these Psalms, which really are records of his prayer to God. And so in this particular Psalm 25, uh, we see David praying uh, to God for his direction, for his instruction. He wants to know God's ways in verse 4, and he also wants to be taught God's paths. He could have set his own course. He could have just made his mind up on everything that he wanted to do, done whatever was most convenient for him. He could have done whatever was most uh, uh, enjoyable for him. But he he said, Lord, whatever it is, I want to do your path. I I want to follow your way. And and that way might be hard. That way might be difficult. I think David, as a youth, was prepared for some difficult paths. I think the way that he he was raised got him ready for tough times in his life and so these paths these ways that God was going to show him and teach him and lead him in may have been very difficult but he wanted to be in the path that God had for his life he did not want someone else to set that path for him to follow he didn't want to miss God's best and so he prays here among other things in verse 4 to God teach me thy paths and that prayer of teach me, David uh, reiterated several times through the Psalms. We'll look at some of those in just a moment. Let's pray and then we'll begin. Lord, we thank you for how you have blessed our church. We thank you for, uh, Lord, souls that are being saved. We thank you, God, for protection and and all the activities and the ministries that are going on. Lord, we pray that you would this evening help us as we look into your word to understand the truth that's here. Lord, a truth that really... um, will determine how much we get out of our Christian life and how much of our life we give to you. 
uh, through this one basic, simple truth tonight. And I pray that it would be clear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. David prayed that God would teach him. And when he prayed that, he was putting God in a certain position and he was putting himself in a certain position. Okay, contrary to modern education, the idea of a student going into a classroom is that the student is going to be under the authority of the teacher. The teacher is going to say, this is what we're going to do. This is what we're not going to do. And here's what you're going to have to do in order to pass my class. That's what a student-teacher relationship uh, is if it's going to be effective. And David goes into God's classroom, so to speak, and says, God, I am yours. You tell me what you want me to do. I'm going to do it. I want you to show me. If you show me, I'm going to follow it. I want to pass this test of life that you've given for me. I don't want to fail at it. I want to know what you want me to do. Show me. Teach me. Lead me. David wanted the Lord to be his teacher. In Psalm 27, we see the exact same request. In verse 11, the Bible says, Teach me thy way, O Lord. Lead me in a plain path. And Psalm 86, 11, David cries out, Teach me thy way, O Lord. And he says the same thing in Psalm 143. In fact, he says it uh, many times in Psalm 119. Let's take a look at that famous psalm, the longest psalm, the one that uh, all but three verses mention the word of God. David was called a man after God's own heart. And everybody has their ideas as to why that might be. Um, I don't know. I think David wanted the Lord to teach him. He wanted to know what the heart of God was because... When God uh, followed God's heart because he wanted to obey God. It wasn't just to fill his head with knowledge about God. He didn't treat God like a systematic theology book or like a, a quiz in a college classroom. Uh, just talking with a pastor recently, and he said something that's very true. He, he was pointing out the fact how sad it is that a lot of kids that start in uh, Sunday school from the time they're babies... And they don't ever remember not being in a Sunday school class, go all the way through uh, the whole Sunday school curriculum, and then through the teens and get to be 12th grade. And sometimes that's the spiritual maturity or how they apply the truth of Scripture is no different or no better than how someone who maybe gets saved as a, as a junior in high school and comes out and, and really wants to learn and they're soaking in the preaching that they're hearing they sometimes you would think the one all that went all the way through would be so far much farther ahead but the problem with that is if teaching simply stops at at the head and doesn't get applied into real life then what is really the use for that i mean there it really what good is it i i watched a guy in in uh, when i was in high school stood up before the entire student body and quoted the whole book of first john word perfect and then several weeks later we're out playing soccer or something, and I hear him let go with a string of cuss words. This is in a Christian school. I sat on the steps in the other building one time and listened to a, a, a team years and years ago quote the entire book of James, word perfect, and then I saw him a couple years later, and his life was a wreck. Just quit, gave up serving God. So it's not what we memorize. It's not all the facts we know. It's not whether we win in Bible trivia. What are we learning from God that we are using and making decisions based off of? I have some brilliant people that can, that can just put us to shame with Bible knowledge. Okay. But you have someone that has the heart that wants God to teach them, and they walk in to hear the preacher preach, and from the first minute of the sermon, they're soaking it in. Then you got the other guy who it takes him three quarters of the message for his heart to soften up to maybe he'll catch a thing or two that the preacher says. I can tell you who's going to be further ahead in their Christian life. I know the way I am. Revival, what would that be like? It would be we come in, we're ready to hear God's word and apply it and use it. We're not trying to pick and criticize and we're not trying to see whether we're going to let this one through or not. We come here to learn, for, to, to be taught by the Word of God. 
A lot of people think David wrote Psalm 119. Look at what David says about how he wanted the word of God to teach him. Verse 12. Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. Then in verse 26. I have declared my ways and thou heardest me. Teach me thy statutes. Verse 33. Teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statutes and I shall keep it unto the end. The word keep there is the idea of guard. When you teach me something, God, I'm going to keep it. I'm going to guard it because it's valuable and I need it. I want it. We look down at verse 64. The earth, O Lord, is full of thy mercy. Teach me thy statutes. Verse 66. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I have believed thy commandments. Verse 68. Thou art good and doest good. Teach me thy statutes. Verse 108, except I beseech thee the free will offerings of my mouth, O Lord, teach me thy judgments. Verse 124, deal with thy servant according to thy mercy and teach me thy statutes. In verse 135, make thy face to shine upon thy servant. Teach me thy statutes. So there we've got King David, most likely as the author of this psalm, Praying over and over and over again, Lord, teach me your word. Now, David could have just walked down to the uh, tabernacle. And he could have talked with the priests that were working there and asked them to explain the books of Moses that they, that they kept there. Read me those books. He could have done that. He could have. That's not, what it, that's not the point. He wasn't asking God to help him memorize. Nothing wrong with memorizing scripture, but he wasn't asking for that. He wanted God to teach him his word. He wanted God to show him the truth, and David was going to follow it as God showed it to him. The word of God was a tool and is a tool that God uses to teach us. Another tool that God uses to teach us turns to John chapter 14. We know this. This is a great gift for us as New Testament Christians that we have the Holy Spirit in uh, and among us uh, as Bible believers, as Christians, we have the, the, the Spirit of God comes to dwell in us. The Holy Spirit in the Old Testament didn't dwell in men. He would come at times upon men. He came upon Sam, Samson and allowed Samson to do some great things. And at times he was with King Saul, the Bible says. But the Holy Spirit did not indwell Old Testament believers. So when Christ went back to heaven, he said, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. He's going to dwell in you. In the Old Testament, he was with them. In the New Testament, he is in us. And so that's a great gift. And part of the thing, uh, the, the job of the Holy Spirit is to teach us. In verse 26, the Bible says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. And bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. So the Holy Spirit is God's gift to us to, among other things, teach us the truth of Scripture. The Holy Spirit living within is another tool that God uses to teach. Then there's one other clear uh, method that God uses to teach his word to us. And this is clear throughout Scripture. And this is... The man of God, the word of God, the spirit of God, and then the man of God. If we think back to the two times where King David really blew it, really messed up, we can remember he did two main things. One, he got prideful and wanted to see how strong of a nation that he was the king over. And so he had someone go over and take a census, number the people, and God tried to get that across from the days of Joshua and the days of Gideon, that he didn't need numbers in order to win battles. Sometimes we think because we're in the minority, we're wrong. God has never used numbers to win the battles uh, of the Bible. If we believe the Bible's true, we can believe that's true still today. God has not changed. And and Joshua was far outnumbered when he went into uh, the land, and, and God used Even with the battle of Jericho, not even a weapon was lifted. God won that battle. We know what happened with Gideon when he 
got whittled down to 300 soldiers to go fight against thousands and thousands of armed men. And, and they're, they weren't even able to have a, 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 a weapon in their hand either. They, at least they didn't need one. And God showed over and over and again, it's not the numbers. It's whether you believe me, whether you do what's right, whether you're willing to trust his word. There come the victories. The, the, the victory looks impossible. And then God gives us the victory. That's the way he works. That's the way he has always worked. And so David, though, said, you know, I'm getting pretty powerful. I'm king. I, I'm getting to control more and more land. He pushed the borders of Israel way out, getting pretty strong. And so he numbered the people, and God right away sent a prophet by the name of Gad. We don't know much about him, but Gad came and went right to King David and said, You've sinned. You've done wrong. You're going to pay a price. And in 1 Chronicles chapter 21, you can see some, uh, later what that price was. It was uh, a really um, painful lesson for David to learn when he let pride into his life. But maybe even more familiar than that to us is the sin that David did when he was supposed to be out uh, in battle. He was in the wrong place, and he was at a place of no accountability, and David let himself fall into sin with Bathsheba. Let's look at Second Samuel chapter 11. In this passage, we know what happened we know that David uh, allowed um, um, the death of the husband who he, uh, or the wife that he had committed adultery with, and uh, trying to cover up his sin. And we could talk about that for a while. Don't we always do that? <laughs> Isn't that our way? Trying to cover up our sin. And uh, so David tried to cover it up. He murdered Uriah. And uh, after a little while, the Bible says in, in uh, 2 Samuel 12, 1, And the Lord sent Nathan. You see that? The Lord sent Nathan. You know what? Uh, in the Old Testament, when the prophets came around, I don't imagine any one of them was wearing a three-piece suit. I doubt any one of them had just come from the local preacher's fellowship and had won the award for the most popular speaker of the week award. I doubt these guys were anything to look at. I, I, I don't know that their personalities were that great. I, I, don't, I don't think they were out to impress anybody. But the Lord sent Nathan. God sends the messenger to people. There's one thing that people don't like to hear today is that God can use men to preach a message and to get a message across. Boy, today's society, especially in America, you're going to tell me what to do? That attitude is everywhere. That attitude runs into churches sometimes. You can tell me what to do. Who are you? Well, nobody, just like you are. But the Lord sent Nathan. Why argue with that? The Lord gave Nathan a message for King David, just like God will give his men messages for us to listen to today. We can get mad about that. We can waste our whole life wondering and criticizing all the preaching that comes from the pulpit, or we can say, you know what? The Lord is using a man of God to deliver his word, and so I better listen. Because there's lots of people, the majority of people didn't want to listen in the Old Testament either. And so they spent 70 years in Babylon. I'm sure that was great. And then never did have a homeland for, for hundreds of years. Why? Why? Don't want to listen to that guy. The Lord sent Nathan. It's a fact. God sent his prophets. Here, the prophet stands before David. And Nathan uses an illustration to point out David's sin. Finally, David uh, got the picture. He finally realized Nathan wasn't talking about some unknown person. He wasn't talking about the guy down the row from him in the pew. He wasn't talking about that guy up there five rows ahead that he can see. You mean you're actually talking about me? David, it hit him. He prayed all those prayers and psalms. Lord, teach me. Teach me. Teach me. Please show me your way. Teach me. So God sends Nathan and teaches him. And it takes him quite a while to figure out, oh, you're talking about me. 
That's for me? David, in um, verse 15, comes across one of the saddest points of his life. Second Samuel 12, 15, And Nathan departed. And the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. Verse 18 tells us he did this for seven days. Verse 17 says that the men of the house went in trying to help him up. Come on, David. There's, there's nothing you can do about it. Seven days David laid there on the ground. Keep your finger there and look at Psalm chapter 51. We know that Psalm 51 was written right about this same time. <clears throat> Look at the heading to Psalm chapter 51. Just before verse 1, should be a little, a lot of the Bibles have a little information there. And it says, A psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet came unto him after he had gone into Bathsheba. David had seven days laying on the ground, fasting, weeping for this child that had been struck because of his sin. In those seven days, I believe, David wrote Psalm chapter 51. And we know what Psalm 51 is. It's the, the psalm of David begging God for mercy. Begging God for, uh, to, to, to get the joy of his salvation back. Because he just came face to face with his sin. Pointed out to him by Nathan the prophet. And David laid on that ground with a pen or whatever he wrote with in his hand and wrote out this most somber, serious of all the psalms that he ever wrote. Teach me, David prayed over and over and over again. Okay? We we pray that and we sin and then God teaches us. That's tough. Because David, after praying and writing this Psalm chapter 51, Lord, give me the the joy of my salvation back. Um, Give me the broken spirit, the contrite heart. Deliver me. Maybe David thought to himself, if I just beg God's forgiveness, maybe, maybe that child will live. Maybe I won't suffer those consequences. But we go back to 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 18. It came to pass on the seventh day that the child died. Verse 20. Then David arose from the earth, washed, anointed himself, changed his apparel, came into the house of the Lord, and worshipped. David learned a lesson. Part of the lesson that he learned, oh, it sounds nice to pray, Lord, teach me, teach me, show me, point my sin out. But when God does and there's consequences, a lot of times human nature is to get mad at God, to start blaming someone else. I just heard this week at a cousin, rarely see her, got diagnosed with a serious disease and she wrote someone, I'm shaking my fist at God, how could he? Consequences David faced the death of the child. God taught David, and it was a tough lesson. David got up and he worshipped. A man after God's own heart. God uses the Word of God to teach us, the Spirit of God, and the man of God. David could have got mad at Nathan when that child died. Could have said, you know what, this is all your fault. You came in and you preached that, that, that this was going to happen. And, and if you hadn't said that, then, then maybe that child wouldn't have died. If you wouldn't have pointed this out, then no one would know. He could have, could have went after Nathan. But he was a man after God's own heart. He meant what he prayed in Psalm chapter 51. Man, do we mean what we pray when we ask God to forgive us of our sins and realize that sin still has consequences? 
if we pay the price for our own sins, are, are we surprised? Should we be surprised when there's consequences for that? If we, like King David, would just trust God and say, teach me, how much better off would we be in this world? God can teach us about our sin. He can teach us to pray, teach us to number our days, teach us to do his will. But today, look, if we would, in closing, John chapter 9. There's so much God wants to teach us and can teach us. We have an entire series of family class lessons. And, uh, boy, we need that. We can learn a lot if we come in with the attitude, teach me. College students can learn a whole lot more than just what they get in the classroom if they go into their ministries and into chapel with the attitude, teach me. But today... We're stuck with the same attitude that Jesus faced after he did a miracle and healed a man that was born blind. Everybody ought to be rejoicing for that. Just think, a great miracle, this man's been healed. Everybody ought to be happy. Not the Pharisees, not the guys that memorized all first five books of the Old Testament, not the guys that knew every little jot and tittle of the law, and we're going to keep the law to the, to the very smallest degree. They're the guys that weren't happy. They had never known God personally. They just knew a whole lot about him. And so when Jesus does a miracle, they uh, get uh, mad. The Bible says uh, here, um, backing up to uh, verse 30, The man answered and said unto them, why herein is a marvelous thing that ye know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened my eyes. <laughs> the blind man says, he, 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 I can see. Just a little bit ago, I couldn't see. You all didn't make me see. Jesus made me see. We ought to be happy. Verse 31, Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. Then answer, they answered and said unto him, this is the religious Pharisees, Thou wast altogether born in sin, and dost thou teach us? Who are you to teach us? Is what these guys are saying. The man, well, who was he? He was nobody. But Jesus had done a miracle on him. He was excited about it, and he was telling them what Jesus did, not something that they could talk about in a book, but something they could see with their own eyes. And they said, do you teach us? Who are you? You know, and I know that attitude is all around today. That attitude is everywhere. And that attitude is something you live with, and unless you shake it out every year that passes, unless I, if I let that attitude in my heart, Every year that passes, it gets doubly hard to get rid of it. It's like prying out a small weed, not very hard, but taking out a tree with some good deep roots, well, not so easy. Dost thou teach us? Maybe unteachableness has hindered the work of God more than anything else. What happens when we live with this attitude? What's the, what's the results? What's the sad results of living with an attitude of, of being unteachable? Well, there's a lot. But one, and I said lastly, this is the last verse, Isaiah 48. And I would like you to turn there, Isaiah 48. Again, one of the prophets of God that uh, had to take a message that he didn't want to preach and that probably not many people wanted to hear. Isaiah 48, verse 19. Isaiah tried over and over and over again to get the people of God to listen to God's word. They didn't want to listen. He was just a prophet. He, he, he uh, wasn't authoritative enough to them. Verse 17, thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Isaiah is preaching to them. I am the Lord thy God, which teacheth thee to profit. Which leadeth thee by the way that thou shouldest go. 
Oh, that thou hadst hearkened to my commandments. The word oh, it's a small word. That is a word of emotion. God loved his people. God loves his people today. And when they don't listen to him trying to teach them, whether by the word of God, the spirit of God, or the man of God, here he, you see the emotion behind that. He pleads with them. He loves them. They're his children, like those of you that have children. And everyone is a child. The love that you have is what the, the same love God shows here. Oh, that thou hadst hearkened to my commandments. Maybe you've said that before or thought that about your own kids. Then had thy peace been as a river instead of an approaching army that was going to destroy the land. And thy righteousness as the waves of the sea stand beside Lake Michigan in the evening as the waves roll in. That's peaceful. But now the armies were about to gather, and that was not peaceful. Look at verse 19. Thy seed, in other words, your children, also had been as the sand and as the offspring of thy bowels, like the gravel thereof, his name should not have been cut off nor destroyed from before me. Verse 22, there is no peace, saith the Lord, unto the wicked. Isaiah said, you know, if you had listened, if you just had listened to the teaching, if you just had listened, if you had been teachable instead of Stiff-necked, hard-hearted, committed to your own way, peace like a river, peace like the waves of the sea. But when we're not, when we stiffen up, when we say no to the Word of God, we don't do that very much. Not many of us are going to hold the Bible up and say, no way. I'm going to say that. How many of us are going to stand in the face of the Spirit of God and say, get out of here? Well, the man of God, that's where it gets tough. When the preaching comes, that's where it gets hard. The effect is still the same. And here, the, one of the consequences is the seed, the children, the next generation, how are they going to make it? You want to put the biggest hurdle that you possibly could in front of your children? You be unteachable as a parent. And expect your child to get over top of that hurdle. There's a lot of things our kids got to get through. Pride, the world, uh, just work. We hear, we've heard about it. But, but to be in the house with a parent that's unteachable and expect them to have a tender heart for the things of God, they're not, that's, not, that's going to be awful hard. Because you know what they're going to have to do? They're going to have to look at you and say, I can't be like that if I'm going to be successful. Whew. That's hard. What's the solution? Well, I can keep the teachable spirit. That's not hard to do. That's not hard to do. I can be teachable. I can listen. Instead of this, I can say, what's that? Okay, let's do that. Come on, enough excuses. Let's, let's do it. And that's a challenge, and it's not something that we solve one time for all. Wouldn't that be nice? That's a challenge every time that we need it. It's an attitude. If we can keep, we can see the Lord bless but if we let that attitude go and we become the tough ones, we become stiff-necked to the teaching of the Bible, uh, not listening to the Spirit of God, ridiculing, turning off the man of God, we're going to have a hard Christian life. The, uh, the uh, early 1700s, there was a group of people that... Uh, were in a, an established church. They um, <clears throat> had one, a, a wealthy man that was in the same church got, got a burden to, for the rest of the world. He lived in an area that's basically Germany today. 
Um, and, but, but he thought about the rest of the world. And he said, you know, here we have a Bible. And they had, Martin Luther had translated a Bible into German. They had a Bible. But he, he realized a lot of the rest of the world didn't. And so he <clears throat> said, I'm going to take the money that I have and I'm going to use it to build a place where we can have uh, people that practice the Bible come. Uh, they will be taught scripture. And, and then we are going to pray and we're going to send those people around the world. Uh, we want to take the Bible, message of, of God, message of Christ around the world. And so he had some money to be able to fund this. And so the area of the world at that time that, that he lived in was called Moravia. And the followers became known as Moravians. And they um, became a, a center for world uh, missions, world evangelism, for, for uh, hundreds of years. Uh, one thing that he established in this community was that they would have a prayer meeting. And they would, uh, the people in the community would take uh, turns. They had a 24-hour prayer meeting. And, and that 24-hour prayer, somebody was praying 24 hours a day. And they kept that up for over 100 years, if you can imagine that. What were they praying for? They were praying for the fact that uh, people that had moved here to escape persecution got inspired to go around the world with the gospel. And they were praying for their sons and, 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 and uh, men that had got on ships and gone for the rest of their life. They, they went everywhere. After just a few years, they had missionaries in Greenland. They had missionaries in India. They had missionaries in the Caribbean islands, which the only way to get to be a missionary there is you had to sell yourself as a slave. Their first two missionaries did just that. They, they, they said, we'll be slaves. And they went down to Caribbean island and uh, worked as slaves in order to um, take the gospel to the slaves that were there. And today, even on those islands, you'll find, if you look, you'll find Moravian churches that were part of that. And this is 60 years before the Baptist in London even thought about sending someone as a foreign missionary. The first English missionary of foreign soil was William Carey. Maybe you remember about him. He was a, a shoemaker. And uh, in 1792, uh, after reading a book about world exploration and uh, after uh, getting burdened for missions, he got up and he preached a message to the local Baptist pastors and said, we need to go take the gospel around the world. We need to expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. And for a while they laughed at him. But after about six months, they had been convinced, you know what? William Carey's right. And so William Carey then went over to India as a missionary. And uh, there established a, a tremendous mission work at the Bible translated into 23 languages in the New Testament. Uh, New Testament lang uh, languages got the, the Bible, 23 languages did, and, and he established a college, a, a dictionary, a, a school, um, and just a tremendous missions outreach. But part of what he did while he was preparing for, to go to missions is he read this missionary magazine that the Moravians had published. And he saw they had been doing it for 60 years. The Moravians weren't Baptists, disagree with some of their stuff. They weren't Baptists, but they were taking the gospel Around the world, William Carey was inspired by that. And one of the accounts that was given uh, about the Moravian missionary families was uh, when the uh, pastor had to come to a couple and tell them that their youngest son, who they had sent off to the mission field, had died. And uh, that was their third son. That was their last son. And the older two sons had died as well in the work for missions. The pastor came to them and he expected uh, a lot of sorrow, and I'm sure there was sorrow, but their immediate response uh, to them was, we wish we had a thousand sons. We'd give them all to God. We'd give them all to his work. And then later that uh, week, that pastor got up and, and he preached his congregation. He said, if we had a thousand families, if we had a thousand parents like that, then we would cover this world with the gospel. Now, <clears throat> we think about the responsibility to maintain a teachable spirit in our own hearts. It's not just a responsibility that affects me. When I get unteachable, 
it affects more than just me. If we can remember that, maybe the next time that we want to stiffen our neck when God comes to teach us a lesson, we'll remember who else is going to pay the price for me being prideful. Who else suffers because I've said no to what the Bible teaches? A lot of people will suffer. On the other hand, with a teachable spirit, if we can find maybe, maybe there's been some years where we've messed up, haven't done some things right. We come to God with a teachable spirit. That's what he needs to use. That is what he wants today is us to come to him with a heart that wants to be taught, wants to learn. And from here on out, who knows what God can do? Who knows what God could do? Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you.